Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, I'm Denise. I'm a business consultant and an accountant. Um, what I find happens when you work in the accounting industry and you work closely with small businesses, you actually become um, a little knowledgeable and savvy in a whole lot of arenas. Um, just because there's so many things involved with small businesses and setting up small businesses. So I started out in accounting and have sort of expanded into a variety of other areas and um, helping people set up small businesses and businesses who are, who are in a dynamic state of growth. So um, a medium-sized business that's growing into a large business often goes through a lot of the um, problems that show up when you're starting a new business. You're doing something different, you're trying to implement systems, you're trying to connect a lot of dots. Um, and the same thing happens in a, a business that's in a dynamic state of growth. So there's a lot of parallels between the two and that's kind of my forte. So anyway, um, so as most of you know, Robert's my husband, so I'm a little familiar with acupuncture. Um, one of the first things I did for Robert was set up a QuickBooks file for him for acupuncture when we had um, his first little clinic um, before he came back to Naoma. So um, I'm going to stop really quick and give you guys um, a handout so you can follow along here. So let's see. for me to get some questions answered for y'all. And also, this is not going to be an accounting class. Um, what I hope to accomplish today is to outline a few um, steps and things you want to make sure you get set up properly on the front end when you start a business, and to get a feel for um, what the impact of tracking your accounting and um, looking at some pieces like legal structure and liabilities and things that tend to be a little broader than just the accounting piece. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask a question while I'm talking. Um, I, I, I don't believe holding all the questions till the end necessarily gets the best information out to you guys, so don't be shy. Um, so with that being said, this the first handout says starting a business in Texas. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly, um, just because most of this you're going to want to do a little bit of research on if you haven't done it yet, um, and it doesn't apply to accounting. So with this part, I'm going to go kind of fast. So the first piece is choosing a name for your business and registering it as a DBA. In Texas, if you are in business as yourself, you don't have to have a DBA. So if, if I'm Denise Seal, working as Denise Seal and filing my taxes as Denise Seal, I don't have to have a DBA. But if I present myself as Denise Seal Accounting and Consulting, then that's different than just me as an individual and then I would have to have a DBA. So there's a little bit of confusion sometimes in when you need one and when you don't. Um, definitely if you're gonna come up with a name, you should get a DBA for it, just so somebody else can't come along and take the same name. Um, so you can get all the paperwork, you can do it all online, it's very easy to do, but determining whether you need one or not is just a process that you'll need to think through when you're establishing yourself and your business. Um, Legal structure is something that you don't hear people talk about very often um, to people who are just starting a business. And I, I personally feel like it's a mistake. Um, legal structure is the type of business you're establishing yourself as. So you may be a sole proprietor, as I am, working just as myself, Denise Steele, and I don't have to really do anything. 
When I file my taxes, I still file the same tax return as somebody who doesn't have a business. I just have to use um, a schedule that includes my business activity and it just all flows through on a 1040 and it's fairly simple. Um, in doing so, however, I have no um, protection for liability purposes based on how I've structured myself as a business. So the pro is all the income just th flows through me. There's not m many technicalities with it. But, and I'm a consultant, so there aren't a lot of liabilities that I have to be concerned about. Um, however, um, if, if you're setting up a business to where the potential for liabilities exist, then you may want to look at how you're structuring yourself as a business a little differently. So legal structures impact both the tax consequences of, your, of what your business does and your liabilities as an individual. So the most basic is a sole proprietor. The, the most, um, uh, the other extreme would be a C corporation. So with the C corporation, it exists as its own entity. So you are either a stockholder or an employee of it. It is a taxable entity itself. And in doing and in being so, you as an individual are not personally liable like you are when you're a sole proprietor. And in between those two extremes are all these other things I have listed. And so becoming familiar with legal structure and what the pros and cons are for you as a small business owner getting started and as you grow um, can be very, very beneficial. And I find that it's a conversation that doesn't happen nearly enough. So just be familiar with it. You can do a search on the internet and get some really fabulous websites with information that will show you the differences. There are also some resources through both the state of Texas and through um, the federal government that are like startup guides for small businesses and they also have some videos and some um, information on legal structure. Um, as far as selecting an accounting method goes, there's two accounting methods that you can use. One is the cash basis and one is accrual basis. Anybody in here familiar? Ever heard of them? So the difference is this. When you're on a cash basis, income is earned when you get the money in your pocket. And expenses are incurred when you write the check for them. So it happens at the point of the cash transfer. So I'll give you an example on a cash basis. Let's say it's you know December 31st and I come in for an acupuncture treatment. But I don't actually pay you till the following week. So if my service was $100 on the 31st, when you filed your tax return, if you're on a cash basis, you would not include the $100 as income for that calendar year because you didn't actually receive the cash until the following week, which was the beginning of another calendar year. So that's on the cash basis. And basically, you can go directly off your bank statement. If the cash came in in that calendar year, it counts as income. And if the expense went out in that calendar year, it counts as an expense. You put the two together, and what's at the bottom is basically your net income for the year, year your taxable, um, taxable income. So what happens with an accrual basis accounting is you actually record the income and record the expense during the time period that you incurred it. So in the accrual based system, it would be if you saw me on December 31st and it was $100, but I didn't pay you till the following week, on your accounting, you would show the income of that $100 for the 31st in that calendar year, and the offsetting entry to show that you hadn't received my money would have been $100 in an accounts receivable account, showing that you'd earned it, but you didn't have the cash in the bank yet. And so you wouldn't be able to go off exactly what was on a bank statement because you would have this lag time between performing the services and then actually getting the cash.
for them. And sometimes it's the same with expenses. You may incur an expense now, but you aren't getting billed for it for 30 days if it's on like a net 30 billing cycle. So that's the difference between cash and accrual. For you guys starting out, it may not make much difference, but as you grow into a larger business, you may decide that there are some pros or cons to doing one or the other. Generally speaking, you can switch, but you should try and pick one and stick with it. It simplifies your accounting. Um, I personally prefer accrual, but most people who are sole proprietors use the, use the cash system. So, um, so that's just a little bit on selecting the accounting method. Um, here in Texas, if you're a sole proprietor, you do not have to have a tax ID number or an EIN number, um, but you can get one if you choose to. My kind of rule of thumb is if you're a sole proprietor working as yourself with your individual name, you can just use your social security number. If you're not comfortable just using your social security number on legal documents, then you can get an EIN just so you don't have to put your social security out there in the universe as often. Um, if you form any other kind of legal structure, I think it's a good idea just to get one and have it and use it. You can make estimated tax payments with it. You've got it. Um, and generally, if you're growing into a larger business at some point, you're going to need one anyway. So um, also online through the government, very, very easy to fill out and get one. You can fill it out, the application out online and they send it to you in the mail. So um, setting up an accounting system. We're going to come back to this one. Um, but setting up an accounting system is a big piece of what you guys are going to do. And most people who are starting wait too long to do it. They wait till the ball's rolling a little bit. Um, and what happens is you have to then go back and enter stuff to get you caught up to speed. It will take you much longer and cost way more money to do that than if you do it from the very beginning. Also, you'll be less apt to lose write-offs because you're not sure how to record them or you've forgotten about them, you pay for them out of your personal account and you don't have the receipt. So I, it, if, I think the key point of me coming in today talking to y'all would be don't put it off till you feel like you have a little more money or, or a little more time or, or things are moving along more. Start early, start really early. Become um, familiar with the tax document so that you understand what's a write-off and what isn't and how to optimize it. So what I tell everyone is, we don't want to break the rules. We don't want to break the law. We don't want to cheat on our taxes. It's not worth it in the long run. But we don't want to leave money on the table either. And so what I find most people do when they um, start their business is they get an accounting system and they track what they're doing. But the strategy and what they're doing and how they're doing it isn't based on understanding some of the tax principles that impact them. So at the end of the year when they file their tax return, they just take all that information to their CPA and they end up owing whatever taxes they owe. And they've never ever looked at what the IRS is doing with those numbers and if they had choices along the way that would have decreased their tax liability. So a little further down, I've listed know which tax forms you're going to need to file and become familiar with them. What tax form you file depends on what your legal structure is. So if you go back to the beginning, determining your legal structure will tell you which tax forms you're going to need to be using. And print a copy out from the internet and go through each line. And if you're not sure what it is or what it means, go to the instructions. So I'm going to give you an example of why, um, why this is important to do. So for myself, as a sole proprietor, I'm currently on insurance with Robert here. The truth is I shouldn't be because on the tax return, if I were paying for my health insurance by myself, 
I would be able to write off the entire premium. Because I'm on, as a spouse of Robert, through his place of employment, I get zero write-off for it. I'm not being very savvy. I'm taking the path of least resistance, but I'm consciously doing it. But it's one of those things that if I hadn't taken the time to read the form and go, wait a minute, health insurance premium deduction, what is that? How do I get to take it? Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have even known to be able to make the choice. Um, there are things like um, meals and entertainment expenses that the IRS only allows you to take half of. There are certain restrictions with donations that you should be familiar with if you're going to donate your time or services or anything else. So um, it will be time very well spent to print out your tax forms and the instructions and actually read through them. And, and the, it's not rocket science, and they're not nearly as intimidating as what we think they are before we do it. Um, so let's see. Let, um, after setting up an accounting system, become familiar with the state and federal taxes. And so um, I am not going to go through all these. The only one I'm going to go through is the use tax because it's the most misunderstood. Some of these taxes apply only if you're a corporation. Other taxes apply if you're simply doing business at any level here in Texas. Um, the reason I want to mention state sales and use tax is because it can be very confusing as to what's taxable and what's not. They've made some changes in the last 10 years over certain services that never used to be taxable currently are. And there's a use tax that we're supposed to um, let the state know when we purchase something and then actually used it, and we're required to pay tax on that. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that um, in your practice you're selling herbs and vitamins and supplements and things like neck pillows and hot packs and some other miscellaneous items. So in that inventory that you're selling, some of those items are going to be taxable and some of them aren't. Most likely the herbs and supplements won't be, but the miscellaneous items, candles, neck pillows, hot packs, things like that will be taxable. So let's say you're ordering in a case of them and you put 10 of them out on the shelf for resale, but two of them you're going to use in your treatment room. Those two that you use in your treatment room, you should record use tax on them. So the way the sales tax everywhere works, but here in Texas in particular, they want to know that tax has been paid on an item at some point in its life of going from manufacturer to the end consumer. So you either, and so let's say now you're the middleman on it. So if you are buying it from the manufacturer, sometimes you have the ability to pay tax on it when you buy it. If you pay tax on it when you buy it, you don't have to tax the consumer when you sell it because the tax has already been paid on it. However, that's not the way it usually works. Most of the time, you're going to buy it at wholesale from the manufacturer or supplier, and you're going to get it tax-free. And when you sell it to the, the patient of yours, you're going to tax them on it. On those two that you put in your treatment room, you need to record that each of those were worth $10 and you will be required to send the state the tax that would have been collected had they have been sold. And that's what use tax is and it applies to almost everything. So if you buy something tax free and you use it in your business, they want you to record the dollar value of what it is you're using that you didn't pay tax on when you bought it, and then they wanted to collect the tax on it when you file your um, sales tax return for those items that you're also selling. So it can be a little confusing. It can be a little bit of a pain to track. Um, there's not always a lot of a paper trail on it. But do know that as a business, you will probably generate some use tax. So if you're in business over time and you never ever pay any use tax, it can potentially generate a little bit of a red flag. Because they know better. They know that if we buy 12 of something, we're probably going to either give two away as marketing materials or use a couple in a treatment room or take a couple home, you know, to use at our house. So just be aware that 
At some point in the life of a product, it has to have tax paid on it. Is that on the price that you're selling it for or the price that you bought it for? It's the price that you bought it for when you're recording it as a use tax. Okay. So, you know, if let's say you buy it for $10, you retail it for $20, if you use it and pay the use tax on it, it would just be taxed at that eight and a quarter of the $10. And, and then when you sell it to the consumer, it would be eight and a quarter of the $20. So, but that's what use tax is, and it seems to be highly misunderstood by most of my clients, and the thing that's most often not recorded. So anyway, or tracked. Um, so the rest of the taxes, again, they have a lot to do with what your <coughs> legal structure is. Be aware that they exist. Um, I think one more I will mention. The difference between property tax and personal property tax. So we're all familiar with property tax. If any of us own a house, we pay property taxes on our house. If you have a business and you actually own the location where you're operating your business, then you would pay property tax on that piece of real estate. Oftentimes when you sign the lease, um, some of them will require that you actually are liable for the property tax payment as part of your lease agreement. That's not common, but it is possible. So that's all related to real estate itself. Personal property tax, are it, it has to do with the stuff you own as a business owner. So the personal property tax would tax the land in the building, or the property tax would. Personal property tax would tax your acupuncture table and any other equipment that you have. If you have a desk and computers and a waiting room with chairs and couches, um, they want to tax all of that. And that's personal property tax. So that's the difference between the two. But, okay, I'm, I'm assuming with this. That's okay. Um, if you purchase something and you have paid the tax on it when you purchased it and then you use it in your business, you get it taxed again because you You do. It. And guess what? You will get taxed on it every year for the life of that piece of equipment. Oh, yeah. Good. And so it's called personal property tax. Wow. Another tax that's a business related tax, aside from the federal income tax, is called franchise tax. And it's kind of interesting if you Google it, go to the state website, their description of it is, is kind of funny. It's something like, um, it's the tax you pay for having the benefit of being able to operate a business in Texas. Um, and it's called franchise tax. And again, depending on your legal structure, you may or may not have to. So when you take your, your um, tax information to a CPA, they may say, you're required to, to file a franchise tax report also. And normally they do it for you, but just be aware that that's what it is. It's the way the state generates revenue on the fact that you're here operating a business in Texas. So anyway, um, so I've listed these just because if you want to get a little more familiar with what they are and how they apply, you can just Google them and there's a ton of information out there on them. Uh, I was just going to ask really quick with the personal property tax, does that depend on what business structure you have as well or is that just any business? Normally not. If you have a brick and mortar business, mm -hmm. um, usually you'll have to file or you're supposed to file a personal property tax return. Now what I find is it's probably the return that's least filed by small business owners and it's probably the one that's least enforced. Mm -hmm. um, but it does exist, so just be aware of it. A lot of these people go, wow, I've never even heard of that. Mm -hmm. So they're all out there, and sometimes you don't hear about them until you get your hand slapped. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, another question or another um, problem I see sometimes when I work with a new business owner is um, they started really gradually, and so kind of personal and business never was clearly defined and separated. So they've only got one credit card and only one bank account. And they're, they go to the store and they'll buy stuff for the business on the same receipt as stuff for home. And sometimes they'll buy a big pack and split it between home and work. And so what ends up and happens is you're more prone to lose write-offs that way. 
And if you get audited, it's a much more difficult audit if you've kind of thrown everything in the pot together. So even though it's having an additional bank account and having an additional credit card, by having it, it will change your behavior. So for more than any other reason, I like to recommend that you guys get a separate bank account and credit card for your business so that it makes you think about what you're charging to your business and that you're keeping your receipts so that if you do get audited, you have the proper documentation so you don't lose a write-off for something. Um, another thing is, if you have bought a number of supplies the year before you officially open your business, keep good track of those. Your, your business not, may not be in existence yet, but you may be buying things now that will become part of your business. There's a way your CPA can enter those as your owner's contribution to your business and get them sitting as depreciable assets on your books. So keep track of them because you may be able to take advantage of some write-offs and some deductions for things that you actually bought prior to the official start of your business for tax purposes. Um, Say it again? Sell them to your business? You don't sell them to your business, but there's a way you can... In accounting, you have two sets of financial statements. You have your profit and loss, and you have your balance sheet. And on your balance sheet is an account called an equity account, and owner's contributions live there. So um, if you think about regular two-sided accounting, um, if I buy a computer, here it is as an asset, and to get that, I pay cash out of my bank account. So the asset account of computer equipment goes up, and my asset of cash goes down by the exact same amount, right? So what happens when you record something you've paid for yourself, so let's say the computer, so I bought a computer last year, and I paid for it, and I'm going to book it as an asset over here on my balance sheet. But instead of cash in my bank going down right now, I'm actually going to record it as an investment by me as the owner in the equity account for the same amount of money. So if I paid $1,000 for the computer, I have an asset worth $1,000, and now I have an owner's investment recorded at $1,000. Um, Equity accounts are also one of the most least understood accounts. Um, where it will come into play for you guys as business owners as you grow is if you want to go to the bank and take out a loan. They're going to look at how much money you've pulled out of your business based on what you've generated as income. And most of that will flow through that equity account. And there's a certain ratio that they like to see. And so I think way too many people who get started purchasing things before they're officially booking business expenses, they aren't taking advantage of booking that owner's contribution to build that equity account up. So, um, so anyway, so, so keep track of what you're buying now, even if you haven't set your books up and formed your business yet. Um, so set up a system where you're recording your accounting information at least monthly. What I find is people start out with the best intentions. It is no fun. It's brutally painful to do it for most people who are not accountants by nature. And um, you get behind and it becomes this nightmare. So if you can get yourself on a schedule where minimally you're recording everything monthly and making sure you reconcile your bank statement to the activity in your accounting system, you will be able to catch problems and get them addressed when they're fresh on your mind. Too often I end up sitting with someone at midnight, the week before they have to have their stuff to their CPA, and we're trying to figure out something that's not adding up from the prior February. It's brutal. So, if you're running your business with its own checking account, when you get your monthly bank statement, you should absolutely be reconciling it against the activity that's posting out in your accounting program. Um, and if you are, you will know that you've not missed anything or made any mistakes because they should match. 
especially if you've hired a bookkeeper to do your books for you or if you have a receptionist who's handling the financial transactions, you personally every month need to reconcile your bank statement to your point of sale or accounting system. It's the only way you know that it's things are being done correctly. If someone has a, a reasonably thriving small business, about how many hours like, would that be enough for you to work? Like four hours of work, six hours of work, two hours of work. If you just made that commitment and did it monthly, how much time would you budget? I would say you're probably looking at about six hours. And that's being that things are getting entered as you go. So if you're working today and you see three patients and you actually go in and record the service and the payment and that they bought certain um, inventory um, and say the next day you had ordered some herbs and they came in and you receive them into inventory, as long as you're doing the daily things as they go, when you get to the end of the month, it shouldn't, it should be at the most six hours and really probably it could be as easy as two hours. If you've got everything in and all you're going to do is reconcile, it can take as little as an hour. What I find is there's always some receipts that you just kind of stick in a folder and those expense receipts are the ones that normally don't get entered until the end of the month when you get ready to reconcile your bank statement, which is why I would say six hours. So it's the receipt from Target and HEB and the little stuff that you run in to grab that don't get entered every single day as you're doing it. And those are, you know, I like to call those fleas because they're little and they seem kind of insignificant. You let them pile up and the fleas are what will kill you. The white elephant will never be the thing that gets you because you're so painfully aware of it. But the fleas will just catch up with you quicker than what you think. And those little receipts are what I call fleas. And they will take the most time at the end of the month, not the reconciliation part. So anyway. Okay, so that's it. That's my preaching <laughs> about how to get started on the right foot. And then um, the rest of the time, I'm really just going to talk about setting up a QuickBooks file and the chart of accounts. And I think you had a question and I didn't get to you. No, I got it? Okay, good. Good, sorry. Um, so as far as an accounting program goes, there are many of them out there. I have to say I am really partial to QuickBooks. I find the desktop version to be the best one. I'm not crazy about the cloud version, the online. It has limited functionality. And for what you guys are doing, I find it truly doesn't serve your needs. Um, so I like the good old fashioned desktop version of QuickBooks. And uh, the Mac version, also I cannot tell you why but it has some bugs in it it has some limited functionality it is not nearly as user friendly as a PC version is so at this time I'm still recommending the desktop PC version of QuickBooks um, they have many options with it now in many levels the basic one I have to say is tempting because it's really inexpensive but it also is very limited if you can get regular QuickBooks or QuickBooks Pro, it will have more functionality and give you room to grow into it. So that's my little spiel on the versions of QuickBooks. Please go online to their website, find the area where you can do the comparison, really think about what they're saying it offers and doesn't offer, and think about how soon you feel your business will need those. If it's sooner than three years, then spring for it now and just get the version that meets your needs over the growth span of about three years. So. Okay, so in setting up a QuickBooks file, the most, the, the foundation of it is a chart of accounts. And this sheet that says setting up your QuickBooks file, I have a very long example of a chart of accounts on here. Um, if any of you have looked at this, you may be wondering why the heck it isn't a chart of accounts for your profession. And the reason is this. A chart of accounts is unique to your business. It should be well thought out. And it should be designed based on how you want to look at reporting. And what it is you want to track and compare as your business um, grows over time. So if I were to have put a chart of accounts on here that met your industry, 
half the people would have just copied that chart of accounts and they wouldn't have thought about it. <laughs> so I've used something completely different so that you get the concept about how to build your chart of accounts looking at an industry not yours. Um, and so there is a reason that I did that, not just that I'm lazy and I use this for a garden center at one point. So anyway, um, so building a chart of accounts, it, it creates the post. So this is some of the terminology with accounting. So when you generate income or spend money, which is an expense, it gets posted into the chart of accounts. So the chart of accounts are um, broken down into a number of different categories, which I mentioned in this handout. The most common ones you guys are used to hearing are income or revenue accounts. It's the same. Revenue and income are interchangeable. And expenses. So most of us are familiar with we do work, we bring income in, we spend money, it posts as an expense, you do the math, and at the end it's what's taxable. The, the net of the two is either your net loss or your net income. But with accounting, what happens is, and that's the profit and loss. So there's also a balance sheet, and what happens in the balance sheet is it tracks things that exist for more than one calendar year. So a profit and loss is a kind of a snapshot of your income and expenses that occur over one calendar year. And at the end of that calendar year, you'll pay taxes on the net profits. A balance sheet tracks things that can exist over time and are things that aren't necessarily, um, think of it this way, a revenue account reflects the services you perform and the income that you're generating off of it. But the cash that sits in your bank account is actually an asset. It may be what you got for doing these services, but it is a, a thing in and of itself, right? And it's recorded as cash. So if you think about my example earlier on, if you did acupuncture for me on December 31st, but I wasn't going to pay you till next week, that asset would be an accounts receivable, not cash, right? So the income over here would still be generated as income if we're on the accrual basis, but now instead of having cash go up, we'd have an accounts receivable with an increase in that account. And then when you actually got my payment next week, cash would go up and that receivable account would go down. So does that kind of make sense? So what happens is a balance sheet can track things over multiple years. So I may take a loan out from the SBA because I want to build an acupuncture clinic, and I may have 30 years to pay that loan off. So when I took the loan out, let's say I got a million dollars, right? So the million dollars goes into my bank account, right? So that asset account goes up, cash. At the same time, the offsetting entry would be, I now have a payable, a liability of a million dollars, right? And every month when I make that loan payment, I send out cash and that liability goes down a little bit. So do you notice in the entire description of that, nothing impacted my profit and loss? It all lived in the balance sheet, right? The balance sheet doesn't impact my taxable net income at the end of the year. But yet, it affects the cash in my bank account. So one of the most common questions I get from new business owners at the end of the year when I'm helping them do tax prep for the CPA is, if I'm that profitable, why don't I have any money in the bank? And that's why, because we spend money on things that don't immediately impact the profit and loss. And those are generally things like loans and loan payments. They're payable and receivable sometimes. And they're also, um, if I were to buy a, a computer that has a lifespan of seven years, according to the IRS, I only get to write off that computer a little bit at a time. I have, right? So if I buy an asset that lives on the balance sheet, and that asset has a seven-year lifespan, 
One seventh of it moves into an expense account every year for seven years because it has a life and it has a life longer than that 12 month tax year for IRS purposes. So if you're not an accountant, getting an understanding of the P&L and the balance sheet and kind of the way entries flow between the two and what impacts that taxable income at the end of the year is a good thing because it is. The amount of cash you have is not necessarily what your income was and what your taxable income ends up at. They can be, and more businesses get into trouble due to cash flow issues than due to generating revenue issues. And especially as new, in, new business owners, if you're setting up a new location where you do have a lot of outgoing expenditures, it's often that cash flow that impacts your ability to grow your business and anything else. So, so be aware that it's a separate beast. And, and, I, and I know that is a little bit confusing on those two sets of financial statements. So do you all have any questions on that? I'm just curious um, if there are any like integration opportunities. I mean, I guess it really comes back down more to the bookkeeping part and like making sure your postings to your chart of accounts is accurate. So for example, if we're a merchant and we use credit cards, will we be able to like have that automatically post to you know, our revenue chart, or if we have our own business credit card and we get our statement in that it would somehow integrate with QuickBooks? Yeah, so the way QuickBooks works, if you're using it both as a financial accounting package and to track your sales, so let me back up a step. There are point of sale systems which are designed for retailers that sell a lot of inventory, that are really inventory driven. So a point of sale system more isolates the pieces that have to do with buying and selling stuff. Where with QuickBooks, if you, they have an inventory module in it, but if you leave that out, QuickBooks was originally set up to handle people who primarily sold their services. And so the, normally, um, if I'm a graphic artist, I do some work for you, I send you an invoice in the mail, you send me a check back. Um, and so from QuickBooks beginning, it's now got to where you, you can do payroll in it, and you can do inventory in it, and you can do almost everything in it. So there is in the regular QuickBooks file a place where you can do like cash sales, and you can send invoices out. So a cash sale would be, we you did a service right now, I paid you right now, you're not going to mail me an invoice, we don't need to keep track of the fact that I owe you money, it all happened right now, and it's a little cash sales section, and you can use that for everything that you guys are doing, as well as tracking inventory if you're selling herbs and, and supplements and all that other stuff. So what happens when um, you're taking credit cards, you will set up a merchant services account, which is kind of a third party account. And what will happen is in QuickBooks, you're gonna ring up the fact that I just got a $100 acupuncture treatment and bought a couple of bottle of herbs and I owe you $175. And you're gonna swipe my card and QuickBooks will record that that $175 should be showing up in your bank account when merchant services processes it. So at the end of the month, you're going to get two statements now, usually your regular bank account and a merchant services account. And you will go into QuickBooks and make sure every single thing that you put through as a credit card charge is indeed showing up in your real merchant services bank account. So to answer your question, yes, that's what it's doing. It's recording in a ledger in QuickBooks the fact that you've got money going in and out of however many accounts you've set up. And then when those statements come, they're going to reflect what's really sitting in your bank accounts, and you're going to compare the two. And they should be spot on apples to apples. So, how does that work when the merchant services takes a percentage as a processing fee? Do you list that as an, an expense then? As you well? do. So you're going to have two transactions for every... Well, in a perfect world, you will have the ability to have it either deduct the, the they call them discount fees. 
You'll be able to deduct, deduct the discount fee per transaction or in a lump sum at the end of the month. You absolutely always want to do the lump sum at the end of the month. Because what happens otherwise is you have to try and calculate it on every single month one and it becomes really crazy. Uh -huh. um, so what you want to see happen is if I just paid you today $175 with my credit card, you will see $175 on the statement. And then at the end of the month, based on the aggregate of that month's activity, there will be a deduction okay. for so you would just say like $300 January discount fee. So what you would do is you would go in and in essence write a check. It, 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 in, in QuickBooks, because the interface is so user friendly, everything looks like a check, even if it's like an electronic fund <coughs> transfer. And so you would just basically write a check saying $350 went to credit card processing fees to that expense account and you would record that when your statement came. Just like if you had any interest that you gained for a month on a bank statement or if you had any bank fees that were associated with the account that you get when you get your statement, all of those would get recorded when your statement comes in, kind of on that 30-day cycle. So, um, so QuickBooks will record every single thing you do. You can set up a petty cash account in QuickBooks. So you should start out with a petty cash bag. You may keep $100 in it. You may keep a couple hundred dollars in it. When you take cash out, you need to put the receipt back in, and at the end of the month, you need to enter all your petty cash transactions in the petty cash account in QuickBooks and see how much that you should have that much cash left in your bag. So there's a place in QuickBooks to account for literally every single financial activity that you guys do. Um, and it's very user-friendly in doing so. Almost sometimes too user-friendly because it lulls you into thinking you're doing everything perfectly even if you haven't set it up correctly behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So with setting up QuickBooks, what I would say is make sure you do it sooner rather than later so you don't have to back enter. Make sure if you're going to do it yourself that you have somebody who knows it check it for you to make sure the behind the scenes connections are correct. Um, and then make sure if you're hiring somebody to do your bookkeeping for you that you know it enough to know if they're not doing it right or if they're stealing from you or any of those things. I don't see that very often. What I see more often is people who just aren't doing it correctly and you end up, it's kind of the garbage in, garbage out. It, 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 it Just entering it isn't necessarily ensuring that what you're getting out at the end is good, helpful, useful information or even correct information. So, um, so even if you aren't going to do it yourself, become familiar with it and learn it and look at it and um, gain a gut feeling for what's, what it should look and feel like so you can check it. And then my recommendation is always reconcile your own bank statements if you've got a bookkeeper doing your daily entries for you. You never want to have the same person who's doing daily entries and making the deposit at the bank reconcile the bank statement. You should have about minimum of three kind of degrees of separation in that financial piece of cash. And it's hard to do when you're a one-man band, but make sure if you're the one-man band with a bookkeeper that the bookkeeper isn't doing every single piece of your financial side of your business. It's just, it's not safe. <laughs> so, question? No. no. no? Okay. So, um, so as far as the QuickBooks files go and setting up your chart of accounts, um, the example I use in here is about a posting account for a, the telephone, so to speak. So my example basically says this. If you're going to set up an account to chart or to track your phone expenses, you can track telephone, cell phone, internet, web. You could actually have four different accounts for that. Or you could clump it all into one account called telecommunications. 
So the reason I said that a chart of accounts is unique to each person in each business, if you're a business that's all about those four things, you absolutely would track them separately. But if you're a business that's not about those four things, that that just happens to be something that you have to have to run your business, you may not really care whether you look at each one of those pieces individually. So it may be simpler for you to just have one account called telecommunications. Now with y'all when it comes to supplies, if I'm a company that doesn't have much of a cost of goods sold for anything I do, the little bit of supplies I order, I may have one account called supplies. For you guys on the other hand, I would recommend you have multiple supply accounts so that you can actually take a look at supplies in a way that correlates to the services you're offering. So if you're only offering one service, say acupuncture, and all you're buying for that is your needles and the alcohol and, and the, the you know, smaller number of items and they're all affiliated with just acupuncture treatments, you may just have one acupuncture supply account. But let's say you're doing multiple services. Um, and the supplies vary for what you're doing. So let's say you're offering massage and you're offering acupuncture and you're offering um, nutritional services and, and whatever else may fall in there. And the supplies are dramatically different from one service to the next. Then track those supply accounts separately so you get a sense at the end of the year of what it's costing you to perform those services for supplies and whether you've got a better margin on one than the other or whether you need to take a look at adjusting what the cost of the supplies, you know, trying to control the cost of the supplies are. So it's important that when you think through this, you think through how it is you want to look at this information when you're making decisions as your business is growing. So one example would be, um, I recently worked with someone who offers nutritional counseling as well as acupuncture and massage. So for her over time, she's going to want to be able to pull reports that tell her when she's starting to get really booked up, which services she's actually making more money doing. And then she may want to hire someone to come in and pick up. So let's say, for example, um, she's generating the most revenue, and not just income, but the net income, the profit for what she, how she's spending her time. So let's say number one is acupuncture, and one, number two is nutritional services, and number three is massage. So if it were in that order, and suddenly she's really booked, so her time is less and less available, she may want to hire a massage therapist to come in and pick up all the massage, so she can do more acupuncture, because at the end of the day, her net income is better off if she's spending more of her time doing acupuncture. So the whole reason for tracking your accounting information is not to file your taxes at the end of the year. It's to be able to use it as a management tool to help you make decisions about how you're spending your time and where your resources are going. And um, it, it helps steer the growth of your business. So you're always um, basing it on knowing the impact to the bottom line. And far too often people do it just for income tax purposes. So in accounting, um, our little saying is, if you're not measuring it, you're not managing it. So if there's something that you need to be managing in your business, then figure out a way to incorporate into your chart of accounts and post things out in a way that you can pull a report and truly compare it and measure it over time. So. I mean, if you decide you want to track something differently, is it pretty easy to change mm -hmm. this thing? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it so should change. I mean, a, a chart of accounts is sort of a, a, a dynamic changing thing for you that as your business grows and evolves you may find that something you were um, lumping kind of in an aggregate manner into one account you now want to see more detail on it and compare it differently and so you absolutely will expand it and change it. What you want to make sure you do is if as you're doing that over time that you're um, being able to connect the 
you know, kind of the division of it. So there's still a little bit of continuity in the way it nets out in the in the big picture at the end. I'm not sure. So would you start that at the beginning of the year, maybe, or not you even? Really you may not year? even. No. Um, and oftentimes, it, what what you or what you can have an accountant do. Sometimes you maybe were recording things one way, and there's a lot of entries, and to go back and hand edit every one of them would be time consuming, kind of a pain. You, you can do something called a journal entry, which is one big lump sum. It will pull it from here and drop it into here to kind of fix it. Um, and CPAs do that a lot. To, to, and we call it reclassing information. Say we had recorded something as um, an expense in one account that really should have been somewhere else. We'll just reclass it in one fell swoop at the end of the year to have for that annual financial statement to have it live in the right place. And it's something that can be done um, for quick fixes that otherwise would be very cumbersome and labor intensive. So anyway, but definitely if you find you've created a chart of accounts and you've got expenses that you're feeling like they just don't really fit nicely anywhere, you can create another account and you can do it on the fly in the middle of the year whenever, you know, whenever you feel that it suits your needs. So, so any other questions? I'm kind of trying to look at the time. It's, I'm down to about five minutes, so I better stop talking and take more questions from y'all. I yes? do have a concern about what you said about the, um, you don't recommend the, the Mac and QuickBooks. No, I hate saying that. <laughs> Yeah, is there a different system to recommend other than I different? don't, and the truth is, I don't know that I would say don't get the PC version of Mac, but if you have an option, get the, I said that completely wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you have an option, get the PC version of QuickBooks. If you don't have an option, I'm not necessarily saying not to get the Mac version, I don't think it's as user friendly, and there are some features that don't yet exist in it. But I've worked with people who have Mac versions, and it's still a good accounting program. The PC version is just better, unfortunately. And it shouldn't be, that's so crazy. But anyway, okay, yes. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to have um, my own business I, for a while. Um, but I do want to get used to logging my expense, my personal expenses and things like that, just to kind of, I'm also a massage therapist, so I kind of want to be open to doing contract work also. Um, would QuickBooks be? Uh, yeah, a, yeah, it's perfect, especially if you're going to do contract work, mm -hmm. because you can log mileage and all, and any supplies and anything you're buying for it. So, yeah, definitely. In fact, I've set up a handful of individuals to track their household expenses on QuickBooks as well as businesses. So, um, so you can definitely do both. Yes. Um, do we have online, you know, a kind of working of uh, QuickBooks, like a, we, we can do that in the office or at the same time we can do it at home? So, there is. Yeah. There is an online version of it. Um, and I'm not very fond of it. Okay. <laughs> it's um, a little limited in what it can do. And if you think about an online version, every time you tell it to do something, it's loading a web page. Uh -huh. So what happens is your ability to pull reports is really low. And because to me the reason you should be tracking all this anyway is to be able to pull some good reports, um, I'm just, I feel like in the long run, it will cost you more because you pay for it every month forever. Mm -hmm. Where with the, the desktop version, you pay for it once and you can get three or four years out of it. So it will cost you a lot more to do the cloud version of it. And you don't get nearly the benefits from it. So, and I have clients who use it. Um, but I don't think it's best suited for what you guys do. I'll give you an example. I have a client who has a ranch, and all of the accounting activity is done by the woman, the couple who own it. 
but she wants her kids to be more involved. Mm -hmm. And so we got the, on, the online version to where her kids can log in and look too. And they can get on the phone together and talk about it and look at it at the same time. So for them it works. But for you guys, since you're more hands-on with what you're doing, I don't see that there's a lot of benefit to it, and, it, and especially at an additional cost. So, but you definitely can do it, and it exists, and you should take a look at it, because it may be a better fit for you than what I'm describing up here. Go ahead. Um, you kind of answered it a little bit, but so if you buy one version of QuickBooks, you can, it'll be quote-unquote workable for a few years. It's not a purchase that you need to make every single Correct, year. correct. And so what happens with QuickBooks, they start out like with a basic and they stair-step it up all the way to their um, enterprise solutions mm -hmm. version and in between there's maybe two or three now. So what happens is you can start with a basic, um, buy it, you install it on your desktop, it will usually work forever, but after three years they quit giving you free updates and supporting it. I have clients right now that have versions that are like ancient history and they're still using them. So it's not, as long as your business doesn't outgrow the version you have, you, they don't force you to buy a new one, they just quit supporting it. What about as far as like I have contractors for my business so I have to print like tax, like 1099 miscellaneous, are the tax forms still supported or no? Big, big concern in which version you pick. Okay. So if you go online and do the comparison, you will find that certain versions allow you to e-file and print 1099s mm -hmm. and do a lot of that tax related stuff within QuickBooks and some of them don't. Compare the cost difference and I guarantee you for the time it takes you to do them manually, it will be worth the extra hundred dollars to buy the version that will do it for you. And so, so with the updates, it'll still continue, like this year if I bought QuickBooks 2015 and 2016, like tax years, yes. I'll still be able to yes. find the right form. Yes. Okay. And so another thing you want to keep an eye on with QuickBooks, since they do their updates and supports on a three-year basis, don't make the mistake of buying a version that's within a month or two of being that year's over with. Like, call them and find out when the next release comes out and try and buy as close as you can to that. It doesn't always work that way, but every now and then I've had somebody buy one and if they just would have waited another month, they would have had a whole other year of support on it. So, um, so they do it in this three year, three year cycle. So, anybody else? Okay, thank you guys so much for coming. I hope it wasn't too brutally uh, accounting. Um, another thing I will say, I don't know, I only, I didn't make copies of this because it's kind of me. I, I actually wrote this up for a friend of mine who started a business and knew nothing about accounting. And she sent me an email that said, can you explain to me the difference between revenue and income and what are expenses and what are liabilities? And this was my email answer to her that I just cut and pasted. So if anybody is really, really on square one with accounting, you can make a copy of this. Or you can just, if there's only one of you who wants it, you can have this one. I printed it just because I thought there may be somebody here who's kind of on square one. <laughs>